Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center, and I'd like to welcome you to another one of our broadcasts on the Conservation and Community Lecture Series we have out here every month. We're very fortunate uh, this afternoon to have with us environmental writer Michael Frome and his wife, June Eastvold, who's a, a poet and, uh, and also a, a great appreciator of nature, although in a, a different vein. And actually, to get us off on an artistic and literary foot, we're going to have June read a couple poems to us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also a great appreciator of Michael Froh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a given. <laughs> <laughs> well, we live out on the West Coast, and I was down on the beach in uh, the state of Washington, in Grayland. And I guess I just preface this poem by saying, um, Michael has been such an advocate through journalism and the political world and a kind of a give them hell Harry type. <laughs> and I uh, have come at this from a point of view that says underlying all of that and we need to fight for it, is the question, why? So this was done down on the beach in Grayland, Washington. A waste, you say, to sit all day to stare at birds who fly away, to take a twig and etch love's face on shifting sand that winds erase, to contemplate what size the dog who left paw prints beside the log to see dried dune grass piled in a mix and play the child's game, pick up sticks, to confess to waves that dare me come. I am really not as brave as some. A waste, you say, to spend the hours on a foolish day the sea devours. Light fades the line of sky and sea. I only wish to simply be at the edge of God's eternity. Then I think about families and the importance of being in touch with the earth, how significant in these passage times we have. This was done um, up in northern Minnesota along the boundary waters. Mm -hmm. And my second child had gone off to college, and I was there with my two, my other two, but I was having this desperate understanding that Kirsty wasn't with us. Paradise renewed. The sound of rushing waters whispered in our ears. Our feet climbed over fallen tree trunks. Our eyes spotted red mushrooms, piles of deer droppings, multicolored fungi decorating tree barks. The distant sound of water grew louder, closer, round the bend, and there it was, a plunging cascade of crystal water, pure enough to drink, powerful enough to speak again of God, clean enough to take off one's shoes to dangle bare feet in the refreshment of the cold stream. If I were an animal, I would have chosen that place to live forever and ever. But I could not stay. A storm was gathering in the bay. Braced in the arm of an ancient tree, I watched and waited for the rainbow. A proud mother duck swam alongside, followed by her ducklings all in a row. I smiled at her and wondered if she knew that very soon they would swim away and she would have no choice but to let them go. Very nice. Well, why don't we um, say 
one more poem for the end. Sure. Let's <laughs> do that. that makes sense. Sure. It's, it's, a, it's a nice way to go in and out and mm -hmm. uh, talk a little about a different type of writing, prose, <laughs> and uh, uh, talk with Michael a little bit. First of all, about how you ended up becoming this, this kind of new field of environmental writer. Well, I call it environmental journalism. I'm, I'm, I've always thought of myself first and foremost as a journalist. And uh, I got into it through admiration of others who were doing this work in the late 50s. And uh, I've just, my, my, my first um, important environmental book was Whose Woods These Are? The Story of the National Forest. Which we have a copy here. It's a, and it's I, a great I, book. It's out of print. <laughs> but it's but still, you can find it on Amazon.com and absolutely. other places and used books. And, and, and you'll notice I dedicated it to two of my favorite writers, who were Bernard DeVoto and Richard Newberger. And at this point, I want to say I think it's, it's so important for people in the environmental field to study history, to know where it came from, how it began, and the trials and tribulations of those who went before. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to talk a little, if I can, about journalists of that period. Sure. Because when I wrote, wrote this to uh, dedication to, to DeVoto and Newberger, they both w were dead, recently dead. Bernard DeVoto was a, was a, was a, he won a Pulitzer Prize for Across the Wide Missouri, mm -hmm. as you may recall. And then he, he wrote a column called um, The Easy Chair in Harper's. Every month he, he was there with a brilliant, brilliant pen defending the environment from its attackers. And uh, Wallace Stegner, who was his close friend, who later wrote a book, a biography of Devoto called The Uneasy Chair, which I highly commend. And Richard, Richard Newberger was uh, a senator from, U.S. senator from Oregon, who tragically died in his first term. Uh, but he was uh, party to every important uh, vital piece of environmental legislation that went through the Senate, including the Wilderness Act, and just a great, great champion. Curiously, he, he uh, studied at the University of Oregon in, in Eugene, but he never graduated. <laughs> but it didn't stop him from becoming a first-class journalist who wrote for major magazines. He, he really wanted to be regarded as a journalist, not a politician, but he ran for the state Senate in, in uh, Oregon, was elected, to, where his wife, who later six, his wife was in the house, so they were they were uh, they were, in, and they they fought for to protect the the uh, the highways from billboards in Oregon successfully, and and then he he ran he ran an uphill battle to for the U.S. Senate and was elected, and uh, curiously while he was in the Senate, he was still writing articles. He went. <laughs> He 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 said he said I'd rather write articles than be written about. <laughs> I'm sure and, a lot of politicians uh, feel and, like that. And uh, so those were those those were, were two of the people, and another one I I, I of the same no of the same and later period was John B. Oakes O A K E S, mm -hmm. and it's unfortunate he never wrote a book, but he was the editorial page editor of the New York Times, and he was a great crusader for the environment. Through through his editorials, and I'm I'm happy to say I I, I, I knew him pretty well, and and uh, June and I had lunch with him and his wife in, in their apartment in New York a time or two, and uh, I remember I I went I went to to interview him once uh, when I was writing my book uh, Green Ink, mm -hmm. an introduction to environmental journalism and. And I went through his files. He let me go through his files of all these beautiful editorials uh, that uh, I said, gee, uh, why aren't they put together in a book? And I, I, it's not too late. I, somebody should do that. And another writer that I, that I, that I, uh, that who influenced me, he did indeed, was William O. Douglas. Now, most people think we of We don't William, think of him as a writer. <laughs> 
Most people don't think of him as a, as a justice of, of the U.S. Supreme Court. He was the youngest justi justice appointed to the Supreme Court by Franklin D. Roosevelt, and he, he had the longest tenure on the court until he was taken ill and, the, and had a stroke, and, and he, he stepped, stepped uh, out of the Supreme Court. But I think that uh, he, he, he wrote articles and he wrote books. I think he, he, even while he was a Supreme Court justice, he still wrote uh, more prolifically than, than, than most uh, professional writers <laughs> do. And so I, I, I always looked up to him. And another one was uh, Ed Meeman, M-E-E-M-A-N. He was a Scripps Howard editor in uh, Tennessee and uh, in, in Knoxville and then in then in Memphis, and he, 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 and for the Scripps Howard chain, and he tried to get newspapers to cover the environment. Uh -huh. And so I, I think of Ed, Ed Meeman. So, so those are some of the people of, of, of the past that I think of. Now, uh, my latest book um, is called Green Speak. It's a uh, Green speak is called 50 Years of Environmental Muckraking and Advocacy. And I dedicate it to, to three of my living friends who I think have played a, an important role in, in the environment. One is um, Brock Evans, mm -hmm. who uh, is now the head of the Endangered Species Coalition in Washington, D.C., who was formerly with the National Audubon Society and before that with the Sierra Club. And the second one is Stuart Brandborg. Brandborg was the executive director of the Wilderness Society for 15 years. He succeeded uh, Howard Zahnheiser, who was the author of the, of the Wilderness Bill that ultimately became the Wilderness Act. And the third person is a great pal of mine in uh, Tennessee named Mac Pritchard. Pierre it's 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 P R I C H A R D. He doesn't have a T in there, but Mac Mac is 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 typical of great grassroots conservationists who are fighting to save the environment day in and day out. Who are not famous. Who don't want to be famous. Who want to save the earth, mm -hmm. and um, who belong in history there. There's somehow another one like that would be Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, uh, who wrote the Sea of River of Grass, okay. River of Grass, about the about the Everglades. Uh, I think it first came out in 1948. It awakened the nation to uh, to this place that was considered a wasteland. And that has now become a, a treasured national park. So that's what writers can do yeah. when they have the courage and the commitment and the imagination to, to do that. Have you noticed changes over the 50 years? I mean, from when you began and until recently, and either the topics or the yeah, styles? Yes, I have. Um, I'm not sure the sacrifice is there. As the, as as once it was either in writers or in leaders of the environmental movement. I have a line, 50 years ago they were missionaries. And now I'm not sure they are missionaries. I think that's a, a great change that I, that I tend to notice. Can you give an example? Or? I can. Um, Fifty years ago, David Brower, well, David was the uh, first paid executive of the Sierra Club. Mm -hmm. And uh, for Dave, there was no mountain too high to climb and no crisis too difficult to tackle. It was all on principle. And uh, then he left the Sierra Club, and and he was a wonderful. He, 
I'm not sure that he, he not that he was a writer, but he was a wonderful uh, expert on publications. Mm -hmm. He created the the format books of the Sierra Club. The first one with photos by Ansel Adams and prose by Nancy Newell, which were just great. He was, he was, and he also was a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Uh, bef before he went to work for the Sierra Club, he he had been a, an editor for the University of California Press, and then he had worked for the publicity department at, of the concessionaire at, at, at Yosemite, so he knew how to do all of these things. And there was one, one film, <laughs> we're getting off the, I'm not answering your question, but I- <laughs> We'll come back I, to it. <laughs> I'm trying to try get back to it, but- but Dave, Dave, Dave made a made a movie, The Alps of Stahican, with uh, it, they were trying to save the North Cascades, in which they ultimately did, and he was in, absolutely instrumental in getting that national park established. And but he had the genius to use in the in the, the voice of the Vienna Boys Choir, in the Alps of Stahican. Well, in that period. I uh, had been doing uh, a lot of collaborate, collaboration with the U.S. Forest Service. And I remember once my friend in the Forest Service, the director of public relations, they didn't call it, they call it information and education. He called me in and he showed me the film, The Alps of Tahikin. And he said, now, can you write a script for us that will have the same feeling but make it about multiple use. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that that was that was that was Brower. Well, Brower left the Sierra Club, as I said, and he came back and as a member of the board. But then, t uh, he uh, then in, in the year two thousand, he quit in frustration. He said they're not active enough. The world is burning, and they're playing violins. So that's what I mean. That uh, there's not enough vision, not enough courage, not enough guts. The trouble is, if you ask me, that environmental studies are taught too well in colleges and universities. It's something to study. But you got to feel it, and I say, if you feel it deeply, the rest will come. You don't. You learn the studies. I I spent fifteen years in education before I retired. Right. But what I learned. Did you tell this to your students? I do all the <laughs> uh -huh. time. All the time. There's a difference between education and learning. Education is training for employment. Learning is a self-assigned responsibility that people do regardless of whether they're in the classroom or out of a classroom. So it's sort of like, uh, like our professions. They begin with, with a zealot. And then somebody says, let's make a textbook out of it. And, and the students are graded. I had a woman who heard me make a speech one, once, and then she wrote me a letter. She said, I got a PhD in forestry. In the 12 years that I studied forestry, up to and including the PhD, I never once in my classroom heard a professor use or apply the word ethics. Uh, what we're talking about in your field here is management. Mm -hmm. Management means doing less with less. It doesn't mean saving. 
It means applying formulas to be more efficient in producing a crop, whether it's a timber crop, a range crop, or a wildlife crop. I don't think those things are meant to be managed as, we're, as, as they're taught in colleges of natural resources. They don't study poetry. In my own experience with professional managers, they don't read Aldo Leopold, Sand County Almanac. Well, he's an interesting contrast, right? He's a, he's a literary writer. Absolutely. And a textbook Absolutely. writer on, Absolutely. on wildlife management. Absolutely. Well, you know, his book was called Game Management. Yep. But I think he rose above it <laughs> later in life. And uh, managers are not the guys who are going to save the earth. Little people are the, are the, the ones who are going to save the earth through sacrifice and commitment and feeling and prayer. So ask me another question. <laughs> well, the logical question is, is you're somebody who studied federal lands quite yes, a bit, um, yes. forests and parks. Yes. Let's start with forests. Um, as you, you know, in one of your first books, Whose Woods These Are, and then you wrote a history of the Forest yeah. Service. How did you see the forests as, as managed? Well, you well, know, when I came into the, into the forest, into the National Forest in the early, early 60s, mm -hmm. the influence of Gifford Pincher was still very, very strong. Strongly felt. I consider myself to be a pincho man, and I'm 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 called down for that because I'm a pincho man. Because the but pincho saw forestry as a social cause, mm -hmm. and 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 um, pincho felt that the that the earth belongs by right to all people not to a favored few. And I must say, when I came into the National Forest in the late 50s and early 60s, there were Pincho men still around. Sure. And they had the same social conscience, conscience social awareness, and social goals. But then, um, in the middle 60s, it all changed. The managers took hold and they said, now we're through with the stewardship period or the custodian period. Now we're going to intensively manage the forests for what they consider the greatest good, which was timber. Timber or, or, or a grazing crop. And I love the National Forest, but they've been going downhill ever since. And, and the agency's been going downhill, too. When I came into the Forest Service, I think it was the biggest agency in the, in the Department of Agriculture. Now they're in the little offices. Their problem was They made friends with the wrong people. They trained in the wrong schools. They trained in schools which were supported by timber tycoons. They went to school with classmates who went to work for the timber industry or some other industry. Mm -hmm. They felt their, their role was to support industry, including the skiing industry, which has done so much damage in Colorado and elsewhere. But that was, that was their thought. And so it went from social awareness, social service, stewardship, real genuine stewardship of the resource, 
to management and production of a crop for the for profit. So that's the way I feel about it. It's quite a transition. The Forest Service. Let's talk about the Park Service. One of your earliest books is this really nice book, which I've got a more recent edition of, uh, Strangers in High Places, The Story of the Great Smoky Mountains. It's a beautiful book. Thank you. Uh, I wrote it myself. It's my favorite, if I can make yeah. it. Yeah. But it's a, it's a wonderful not to be too academic, but it's a wonderful case study of yeah. one particular park and one particular place. And, and, and tell me how you came to write this book and, and what well, lessons you know, I, 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 I used to go down to, I used to travel around and write a lot of travel articles for different magazines and, and newspapers. And then I wrote Whose Woods These Are, which you have over there. Mm -hmm. And and a salesman for Doubleday and Company said we could sell, we could make some good sales on a book about, about the Great Smokies. And my editor at uh, Doubleday asked me if I, if I thought I could do that. Well, I was an outsider in a in an area that, supposedly was inbred, <laughs> in, in the mountains. But as I think I wrote in this edition, when I got down there, I never felt like an outsider. And the lower they were on the social scale, the warmer their reception was to me. And uh, about that time, the director at that time of the National Park Service, George B. Hartzog, Jr., who was appointed by Stuart L. Udall, um, Udall got rid of got rid of Hartzog's predecessor, Conrad Worth. He told me when I interviewed Udall, he told me Worth was old enough to be my father, and he he had old ideas, and and I wanted somebody more in keeping with my own. It's kind of surprising because Worth. We've seen a lot of his correspondence back and forth with Olaf Murray and some of these folks. I mean, Worth seemed like he would have had something in common with Stu Udall. Well, I think Udall wanted to. I, I think I, I think it had something to do with Udall's commitment to coal-fired plants in Arizona, and that if he got rid of Worth, he could go ahead and and give away Arizona. We don't see, see much of that in history, <laughs> but we should. So he appointed George B. Hartzog, Jr., whose idea of a national park was uh, the Arch in St. Louis. Uh, he was not a naturalist. He didn't have much feeling for nature. He had great feeling for politics. He was a master politician. And he was, uh, 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 Hartzog made a deal with, with politicians and in western North Carolina to build a, a road across the Smoky Mountains that would be good for their business and good politics. Good business is good politics. So I started to write a book about the Great Smoky Mountains and Harvey Broom. Have we talked about Harvey yet or not? So uh, I met Harvey Broom, who was uh, the president of the Wilderness Society as it happened, but who lived in Knoxville, Tennessee, and who had spent m many, many days and nights in, in the Smokies. In fact, he's, there's a book of his, Out Under the Sky of the Great Smokies, which is a beautiful story. And so um, I fell into Harvey's clutches, and I said, I want my book to be, to be a, a tool an instrument for the protection of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, for the wilderness of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And uh, it's funny, the book the book came out, and they they wouldn't sell it in the national park. And I went over to Hartzog and pounded on his desk, and I said, "You can't do this." <laughs> So he, he, he told them to go ahead and sell the book in the park. And they, they sell a lot of copies in Smoky Mountains National Park to this day. So, you know, I figured, how can I really help this park? 
So that's that was my inspiration, you know, to get to get back to what I'm talking about, to have the courage and the feeling and the commitment and the desire and the goal and the sacrifice to really do what needs to be done. Well, you also wrote a, a broader look at the national parks called I Regreening. Wrote Regreening the National yeah, Parks. Yeah, Regreening the National Parks. And uh, Thank you. <laughs> that had a slightly different theme <laughs> to it, although... Similar. Well, I tried to be upbeat and positive that, that, uh, that if... That if the people who work for the National Park Service, who care about the parks, will reach out to the community and find the public that cares about the national parks and the media that cares about the national parks, then we can re truly regreen the national parks. But it's the same thing as I said with with the with the national forest. They get in bed with the exploiters. And in the case of the of the national parks, with uh, commercial interests that see the national parks as dollar signs. What's driving that? Do you think? What's driving that? You know, to my mind, you, the most important the most important element in the life of a career public servant is his or her evaluation. And they don't want to risk a negative evaluation by dealing with the public. And what, what drives it is peer pressure. Nobody wants to say, I'm not going with the rest of them. In fact, I, I, I know a fellow who was in the Forest Service. He was in a meeting with the supervisor and the supervisor's staff. And he said, you know, we ought to listen more to the Sierra Club and to people like Mike Brown. He said, the room went still. And he said, from then on, his career was, was finished. And so basically, I shouldn't be talking to you right now. <laughs> well, well, you know, you know I, I, I think it's just wonderful that you are. I think it's wonderful that you are. As I, you know, I. We're here in uh, Shepherdstown, and in, uh, over the years I spoke, I lectured many times, at the, several times, half a dozen at least, at the uh, Park Service Training Center. Mm -hmm. The Mather Center there, yeah. At, at, uh, at Harpers Ferry. And the director of the training center at that time, he wanted to broaden the horizons of the Park Service people, not now, now. But in, 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 the, in, in education, it's narrowing. It's not broadening, in my humble judgment. Uh -huh. That's probably very true. Well, after your evaluation of the Park Service and the Forest Service, I hesitate to ask you, what do you think of the Fish and Wildlife yeah, <laughs> Service? Yeah. <laughs> Something uh, you haven't written a book on yet, although you touch on it in, in some of your other books. But what is, we're just well, talking you know, about I, I, I used to write a lot about it when I... When I was with Field and Stream, yeah, columns and that. I wrote. I was the conservation editor of Field and Stream for seven years, and uh, I knew a lot of the people in the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, including some who were in trouble. But uh, I mean, we need the Fish and Wildlife Service. We need the refuges. We need to save our wildlife. I don't think, I don't think the people of the United States have any more significant challenge to meet than to save our wildlife heritage. We need leadership in wildlife. 
to identify uh, needs, priorities, federal, state, county, and local to protect the habitat of our shrinking wildlife, and I hate to call it resource, mm -hmm. but our populations. We're losing them all at all levels. So we need strong voices, strong organizations. We need the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I, I used to know a lot. I used to, I used to travel around, and I've spoken to training programs of, of the Fish and Wildlife Service in those days, and of the refuge managers. So I haven't been in it much lately. You know, I'm older than I used to be. <laughs> and uh, but uh, I think I think I think the people who work for all of these agencies. can make their own assessments of the needs, of the crying need for, for truly professional, inspired, daring leaders. That's what we need. Can you think historically of folks who've met these criteria? Yes, um, <laughs> I, I can. In the, in, the, in the park service, I think Steve Mather was one, the, the first director, you know, that story's been told many times about how he was out in, in, in Glacier with his daughter, I believe, and, and they were logging in the park. <laughs> he said, get rid of it. And they didn't get rid of it, so he got rid of it. And Horace Albright, uh, the second director, who, who I'm privileged, Horace is one of the great men I've been privileged to know in my lifetime. And Horace told me about how he uh, had a run-in with Senator McKellar of Tennessee, but he held, who wanted a road, he wanted a road, he wanted a road across the Smoky Mountains, and how he stood firm against him. <coughs> I, I, I think uh, Gifford Pinchot was a great campaigner and crusader and leader and ins inspiration to his troops. I think Ding Darling probably was too in the Fish and Wildlife Service, both before, during, and after his mm -hmm. his time as director of, of the Fish and Wildlife Service. So those are a few. I wish I could think of a more. I I I, I yes, I want to mention the John and Frank Craighead, who. Uh, who has spoken up for the grizzly bear with vehemence and told us we can save the grizzly bear, but we're losing the grizzly bear. And Morris Hornacker, who did the same for the, for the mountain lion, the cougar. Mm -hmm. So those are people I, who come to my mind. And there, there are others as well, and citizens too. So that's what that's I. It's a good think. list you gave us there. Let me ask you about this last book we have out here on the table, yeah. The Battle for the Wilderness. Uh, why did you decide to call it a battle for the wilderness? Well, I made a speech somewhere, and I said it's the un it's the unending the unending battle in our in our civilization to to fight to save what we've got. How do you see the two forces? I arrayed? think, uh, you know, in 1964, we succeeded in getting Congress to pass the Wilderness Act, but that wasn't the end. It was only the beginning of identifying areas. Not only that, but once you've got an area identified and saved by law, you have to keep saving it all over again from politicians and, and, and administrators. So it's, a, it's not only is it a battle, it's an endless battle.
to save the wilderness. But, but you know, we, we, we talk about uh, Americanism. What's more American than the earth the way God made it? Or whoever made it, if it's not God. And uh, I don't think there's uh, an economic argument. And economic is the wrong term because economy is in stewardship. Gifford Pinchot told us that. Economy is in stewardship. Profit and commerce are an immediate exploitation for the profit of a few, not for the economic and spiritual and physical well-being of civilization over the long run. That's a very eloquent quote. I don't know whether it's eloquent, but, <laughs> but uh, it's where it comes from. Um, and part of the problem is that eloquence is not tolerated in the training of professions. It's not tolerated in the tra training of wildlife professionals, forestry professionals, park professionals. I'm not sure about history professionals. <laughs> it's still allowed. And it's not, it's not, it's not tolerated in, in the training of journalism professionals. Uh, in journalism, just get the facts, ma'am. Give me the facts, ma'am. And don't put yourself into your story. And uh, it's not the way that I teach it. I think you are the story. So, well, your uh, own journalistic career went through a fair number of journals, too. Well, I had, a, I had a marvelous journalism career. I loved working on newspapers. I loved the, the Daily Deadline. I lo dearly loved that. But then I went on into, to, to other things uh, where, I, where, I, where I was enabled to express my, my, my feelings. And I think in the magazines I could do that. Uh, to 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 a pretty good extent, and and uh, I wanted to be an editorialist, uh, and and yet yet all of our, all of our all of our all of our big newspapers, they're all editorials. They're editorials uh, for business. There isn't a business writer in the country who doesn't favor of business. There isn't a sports writer in the country who doesn't favor sports. And there isn't a publisher in the country, or very, very few of them in, in mainstream journalism, that doesn't favor business. And, Does that uh, mean environmental journalists favor the environment? <laughs> so the environmental journalists ought to favor the environment. In my humble judgment, maybe it's not so humble, <laughs> but but that's that's as I say it. Let me ask you one last question. You've you've been an environmental journalist many many decades now. What advice would you give to all those young people <coughs> trying to enter the field? I would say, trying to not say some be hackneyed at all. No, no, but just for somebody who's well, done it. Well, work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard, dig in hard, dig in and dig in right from the heart. Be a good writer. You got to be a good writer. I wish I was a better writer. Good writer. And, uh, and pick a model as I did uh, with uh, Devoto and Newberger and and others that we mentioned mentioned before, and Rachel Carson too, and and I, I mean we we haven't talked about Rachel Carson, but uh, she took a lot of abuse 
and her abuse is her the abuse that she took is not not celebrated, but it might not have been celebrated, and she would still have taken that abuse. I have to talk about one woman, one other woman, and it's Marjorie Carr. I mean, getting back to wildlife, Marjorie Carr. I mean, to show what people can do. Mm -hmm. I talked about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in the Everglades, and Marjorie Carr lived in Gainesville, Florida, where her husband Archie Carr. Do you mm -hmm. know of him? We have a refuge named Archie Carr National yeah. Wildlife. Well, Refuge. well, you should have one name for Marjorie Carr. <laughs> Marjorie Carr's husband was an expert on turtles and a, wrote books on turtles and a prominent biologist. And she was a just a marvelous woman, and she, she I read about her uh, in Field and Stream. And she awoke one night, and she said to herself, the Corps of Engineers must not complete the Cross Florida Barge Canal, which was a big ditch across the Ocklawaha River. We must save the Ocklawaha. One woman, <laughs> and she communed with other people and with politicians. And I must say it was the Republican president, Richard Nixon, who mm -hmm. canceled the whole thing and restored the Aqualaha River. So, you know, I and I owe something to Marjorie Carr. Uh, in my life, she's dead now, I believe, I think. Not Marjorie, I apologize. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's inspirational to work with these people and to know they're there. And that's what they don't get in colleges and universities, in my humble judgment. The inspiration from the folks right. you cover. Right. Well, thank you very much, Michael. And why don't we go out, if June's willing, <laughs> with one more well, lovely I'm poem. I'm just listening um, to you and... Uh, I'm thinking about uh, a poem I wrote, Covenant Undone. <laughs> this was at a time when there were lethal materials that were being loaded on a ship, <coughs> and it tried to dock in Seattle, Washington. Remember that. Do you remember that yeah. story? And it was refused, and so then it went on up to Vancouver, B.C., and they turned it back. And so it was from a U.S. military base, and it had been loaded um, in Japan. So they sent it back over to Japan. And the same week, there were two whales that uh, died and drifted ashore. And one of them, interestingly enough, floated up at a and b that was owned by a former US congressman, Jack Medcalf. And the other one floating into Bellingham Bay, where we live. Uh -huh. And uh, the carcass was lying there, and the stink almost overwhelmed the, the smell that was coming from the Georgia Pacific plant, which, by the way, we've gotten closed. So anyway, um, I was reminded of the quote, you can watch the sky and predict the weather, but you can't see the signs of Jonah. This is called Covenant Undone. And I'll read you the poem. Okay. Bla <clears throat> Blood stains streak the sunset, snake swift across the bay. A silver ship reflects the stains that bleed red warning at the end of day. Whales in the crimson wake spout crystal fountains, yet draw foul breath. The ship they tease has hidden cargo, contaminated wastes of death. No harbor opens to receive the waste that's laced with toxic taste. No moon arises to shed more light as the bloody trail disappears in night. The phantom silver ship moves round, perpetual in motion. Should it strike against the rocks, death released will sink the ocean. Bloodstains will streak the raging sunset, bleed red anger toward the shore. 
eagle wings will not lift high, and the dove will promise peace no more. I think we need to keep that frame of accountability and legacy before us. And I just want to finish with one very short sure, poem. Sure. It's one of Michael's favorite. Because we talk about the forests and the huge mountain ranges and all the wildlife, but there's another very precious, small, beautiful piece of the creation that they call in Mexico the mariposa. Mm -hmm. And in all the world, there are no butterflies that migrate like the monarchs of North America. Yeah. They fly in masses and they travel great distances and they are a phenomenal, beautiful part of our world and they're being destroyed. Mariposa. Sleep, Mariposa, settle light on the leaf. Sprinkled in daisy dust, sit soft in relief. Rest, Mariposa, on the day of the dead. In petals amarillo and crimson blood red. Drop down, Mariposa, from millions of wings. Take flight in solitude and the peace that it brings. How dimly my soul will finally burn if ever, bright butterfly, you cease to return. That's a wonderful poem to go out on, especially yeah. here at the Fish and Wildlife Service where it's from my we protect book. endangered butterflies, among other things. It's from my little book, Another Second Chance. Well, there are a number of poems like that in it. Yeah. Thank you so much, June, uh -huh. and thank you, Michael. Really appreciate you coming out here to Shepherdstown. And hopefully you'll come and visit us again. And we'd like to thank everybody who had a chance to tune in and have this very stimulating three-way discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hope you'll tune in next month. Thank you very much.